Hey, Donnell High School, this is Mr. Aiden, this is Part 2 Kinetics, and I feel the need, what Maverick said, the need for speed, and this is going to finish out our kinetics. We're going to go to what we call integrated rate laws, integrated rate laws. Now, see here on the left-hand side, this is what they give you on your equation page for kinetics. They give you this crazy natural log of A sub T minus natural log of A with a zero equals negative. They give you this stuff. Let me tell you how to interpret it, okay? Now, the thing they don't give you, they do not give you zero order. They only give you first order and they give you second order. So let me show you what these actually mean, okay? First, let me go to zero order. Zero order, they did not give you but all zero order is, is instead of it says natural log of A or 1 over A, all zero order is, is if you graph concentration of one thing and time, you will end up getting a straight line if it's zero order. If it's not zero order, it's not going to give you a straight line. Okay, so if we graph, and you can see this is in a y equals mx plus b. So the y axis, we're going to put concentration of A. On the x-axis, we're going to put t, and the slope, we get negative k, which means if you get a straight line on this, guess what? It's zero order. If you do not get a straight line, let's say your curve looks like this, it's not zero order. It's not zero order at all. It's only got to give you a straight line if you graph concentration time, only if it's for zero order. Now, if it's not zero order, then you could try first order. If first order, you can see all I did, took, did with their equation was I manipulated it. I moved the natural log of a naught, that a with the zero time, I moved that over to the other side. So it would be in y equals mx plus b format. So you can see on this one, this time I'm graphing on the y-axis natural log of the concentration, and I'm going to graph time on the x-axis, and if that gives me a straight line, ding, 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 that's first order. If it doesn't give me a straight line, guess what? It's not first order. Only if it gives a straight line when you graph natural log, which is just a button on your calculator, natural log of concentration versus time, that means it's first order. They also give you the equation for second order, and you can see I manipulated that equation to just move the 1 over the a with the 0 over to the other side. So it's in y equals mx plus v format. So for second order, you can see if I graph not concentration, not natural log of concentration, but I graph 1 over the concentration and time. If that gives me a positive slope here, positive k, then I know I have second order. So guys, you can know what order the reaction is, whether it gives you a straight line. Okay. Now, if it gives you a straight line with just concentration and time, it's for zero order. If it gives you uh, a straight line with natural log of concentration and time, first order. If it gives you a straight line with 1 over the concentration and time, it's second order. Okay, But it's only giving you give a straight line on one of these graphs, because it's only either going to be 0, 1st, or 2nd order. They also give you an equation, this t1 half equals 0.693 over k. That is the half-life equation. And of course, we just figured out how to find k. So if you know it's k, now this equation only works... This equation only works for first order half lives. This only works for first order reactions. Which, guys, most of the reactions in our world, which is things like nuclear reactions and hydrogen peroxide, decomposition of hydrogen peroxide, and, and all first, th these are all first order reactions. So you can use 0.693 over K. So if they ask you to find the half life, just take 0.693 over K and find the half life. So that is called my integrated rate laws. We also have a thing called mechanisms. And all mechanisms mean is that the reactions that we see are made up of a lot of tiny little reactions, a little tiny little elementary reactions, or, or just some steps. Okay, And some things you want to know is the slow step of the reaction is the rate determining step. I'll say that again. The slow step... Oh, wait. The slow step of the reaction is the rate determining step. Okay, That's the slowest step in your reaction. An intermediate is a substance that is produced and then consumed right away. Okay, So an intermediate is something that is intermediate. You made it, and then you use it right away. And then we also have a catalyst, and a catalyst is a substance that is not consumed in the reaction. It's there at the beginning, and guess what? It's there at the end. It is there to either lower the activation energy or provide a different pathway for the reaction. Let me give you an example of what a mechanism problem looks like. Okay, So here 
and I have this reaction. It's going through three different steps. The first one's fast. The second one's slow. The third one's fast. Okay. So if I want to know the overall balance reaction, all I need to do is anything that is on the right-hand side, I can cross out that is on the left-hand side. Okay. Anything on the right-hand side and left-hand side, I can cross out. They kind of cancel each other out. And you can see the Z is also canceled out as well. So what's the overall balance reaction? Well, on the the reactant side, I have two moles of A, and I have two moles of B. On the product side, I have one mole of C and one mole of D, and that would be the overall balance reaction. Now, if I want to know the rate determining step, which one is the rate determining step? The rate deter determining step is always the slowest step, is your rate determining step. Now, if I want to know the rate law of the reaction, remember, rate law always looks the same. It's rate equals K times A to some power times B to some power. Now, how you figure out your, your rate law using mechanisms is you go through every reaction up to the slowest step. So you can see in the first reaction, I have one, two moles of A. And then in the second mechanism, I have one mole of B. And that is the rate determining step, so I stop there, which means I am second order with A to A. I'm first order with respect to B. Why? Because I went through two moles of A and one mole of B. You may ask, why don't we need that, that mole of B that's in the third mechanism? Well, that guy's after the rate determining step, so it doesn't really matter. Okay? When I want to know my intermediates, when I want to know my intermediates, remember an intermediate is something that was produced and then consumed right away. And you can see, if I take these away, my intermediates will be X is an intermediate because I made him, and then I consumed them right away. Y is an intermediate because I made him, and then he was consumed right away. Which one is my catalyst? Well, my catalyst is pretty easy. He's the one there at the beginning, and he's the one there at the end. That would be the catalyst. Let me show you what the rate law would be if I switch around the slowest step. Remember, the slowest step is your rate determining step. That's the only step we really care about, or up to that step. So my rate law would be rate is equal to K times A to some power, B to some power. Now, remember, the rate determining step was it. So how many moles of A did I go through to go up to my rate determining step? Two moles. How many moles of B did I get up to? None, because that was my rate determining step. All the moles of B were after my rate determining step. They don't matter. So guess what order it is with respect to B? It's to the zero order. And anything to the zero power is one. So this would be my rate law for that kind of mechanism. Let's look to see if the rate determining step was my final step. If my rate determining step was my final step, this would be rate is equal to K times A to some power, B to some power. Now, how many moles of A did I go through in order to get up to my rate determining step? I went through two moles of A. How many moles of B did I go through? I went through two moles of B. So I went through everything to get there, and so that is my rate law. We got one last thing to kind of teach you in kinetics, and that is a thing called collision theory. In order for any reaction to occur, their number one has to be enough activation energy, or the molecules have to collide with enough energy in order to break bonds. If you don't have that energy, the reaction doesn't happen. That's number one. And number two, they have to collide with the correct orientation. If they don't, if they don't collide correctly, they won't react. Let me give you an example. Here I have this, we, we have four different sites of these collisions. We have HCl colliding with this CH2, double bonded to CH2. Now you can see, I'm going to start on the right-hand side. Let's look at collision four. This one will not make a reaction because I did not break that double bond that I wanted to break. It won't happen. This one did not break the double bond either. He, that HCl didn't come in at the correct orientation. Now look at collision two. This actually won't happen either. Because remember, chlorine has the negative side, hydrogen has the positive side, and remember this double bond is filled with a bunch of negative electrons. What are negatives do with the negatives? They repel each other. So that's not the correct orientation. Only collision one has the correct orientation. Has the positive side coming attracted to the negative electrons, and it comes in with enough energy and kablooey busts up that double bond. Okay.
Here's this graph again, this Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, and we see this with kinetics as well. Now, what does it look like with kinetics? What this is saying is the area in the green is actually the number of molecules, the number of particles that have enough activation energy in order to react. You can see in the area in the blue, they, they're not going to react. They don't have enough energy. Only the small little percentage of the molecules in green end up reacting. Now watch what happens when to this graph when I add a catalyst. A catalyst takes this activation energy and lowers it. If it lowers the activation energy, that's the activation energy of a catalyst, if it lowers it down to here, do you see what just happened? I now have more particles that can react. You can see why a catalyst speeds up the reaction. There's more particles that are colliding with enough energy in order to react. So that's what would happen if I added a catalyst. That's what this reaction, this graph would look like. Now watch what happens if I, to this graph, if I look at a higher temperature. If I have something at a higher temperature, what's my graph going to look like? It'll look like this. Okay? And you can see what just happened with that is, this blue line would be at, I'll call that T2, I'll call this first line T1, and T2 is greater at temperature than T1. Let's say it's 400 Kelvin or 500 Kelvin, something greater. Look what happened. At the same activation energy, there's more particles that can react. So when we're at a higher temperature, why does our reaction rate go faster? Why does our reaction speed up? It's because more particles have enough energy in order to collide. Guys, that is all of kinetics. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope we get a lot of practice and are good at it. I'll catch you on the flip side. Yo, yo.